Well, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about mathematics and language development. So I'm going to share my screen here. There we go, right into the presentations. So we're going to look at language development and mathematics learning with a focus on problem solving development. So there are some key themes of ELA and literacy and ELD instruction. Um, across the curriculum, we focus on making meeting. So what is the central purpose of interacting with the test, text, of discussing, of completing research and making meaning of it? So no matter what context we have, what area we're focusing on, we need to be able to come up with meaning from what we're reading to apply it to the situation. We need to look at language development. It is with and through language that students learn, think, and express ideas and questions. So language development is something that's used in all curricular areas. And then content knowledge. Content knowledge is a powerful contributor to comprehension of text and it undergrids the ability to write effectively, engage in meaningful discussions, and present information. Content knowledge has the power of a reciprocal relationship with the development of literacy and language. So we're using literacy and language and in this context to communicate our mathematical thoughts and ideas. So in other words, we need to put into practice with our emergent bilinguals everything we know about learning, which is we need to respect our students as knowers and learners and recognize the activity, the constructive nature of learning anything, particularly a language. And we need to provide authentic, meaningful experiences and social contexts with rich materials. So how do we de develop academic language in a content area? Well, we're gonna look more closely at learning English and math. So first there's the job of conceptualizing how is language acquired? And it's through two different ways. One is the input, and that's how we help students understand the demands of our instructional task. And then there's language output, how we can help students practice academic discourse to build language and math proficiency. So input and output. And there are gonna be four components that I discussed today, two that relate to input, and two that relate to output. So here's an overview of the components. And when we're looking at the first one in input, it's the context. So we're looking at the culture and the tools that go into creating the context for learning. And then the second part of input is language demands and vocabulary development. And in subsequent slides, I'm gonna break this down into um, more specific details for you. And then there are two components of output. One, um, number three there, norm and skills for conversations. So how do we set those up in the classroom? And then four, varied structured opportunities for using the target. So academic English in mathematics. So be thinking in the back of your head, during which phase of a lesson would each of these components likely occur? Or would each be used throughout a particular phase? Or Think about um, the lesson plan phases and where you would insert certain strategies and looking at language. So would this happen during the opening of a lesson, the launch, where we're unpacking a problem in mathematics? Would this happen during the body of your lesson where you're really solving the mathematical problems? Or would you use some of these components in the closure where you're reflecting on progress and strategies? So let's look at these four components more closely and remember, think about where they would be situated in a math lesson. So unpacking the four components. First, let's look at that idea of input. And what we mean about comprehensible input is understanding the language. So we have to look at the context. We have to decode the context enrich the context. We have to provide tools for solving the problem. Do the students understand what the, what the problem's asking? Can they relate to how it's situated? And then we also need to look at the language demands. So these are things like vocabulary and linguistic demands. 
So when we look at decoding the context, this is that first part, we look at 1A, what is the cultural knowledge embedded in the problem? So here's an example. At my parties, people shake hands with everyone exactly what time, at one time. <laughs> what happens at other parties? So in some cultures, maybe the greeting isn't to shake everybody's hands. Would that be hard for somebody to understand that context of what happens at a party? How can you ensure that students understand the cultural knowledge? You want to decode the real world setting in the problem and provide images or video or conversation. So this helps students understand what is going on in the problem. So I'm going to use some um, GIFs to get you to decode. Um, so I'm going to use actually memes rather. And I want you to think about what do these mean? I'm going to show you a couple. So a meme is an idea, behavior, or style that spreads by means of imitation for person to person with the culture and often carries symbolic meaning representing a particular phenomena or theme. So here's one appreciated you are. May the fourth be with you. So as you can see, this is a cultural reference to Star Wars. Many of you might be Star Wars fans. So if you hadn't seen Star Wars, you might go, I don't know what this is all about. So you have to bring in that cultural lens and, and have that knowledge of, um, of what the situation is. Here's another one. There are no bad kids, only happy little classroom challenges. And, um, if you remember, this was a painter that was, um, his name's escaping me right now, but used to do all these drawings and talk you through. Um, and this was something that I grew up with from my generation. So um, students that are even older than me or younger than me may not relate to this as well. So it's always good that you have a cultural context for the situation. We have to be mindful of that when we're presenting math problems in the classroom. So bonus strategies for cultural context, you might change the cultural context to match the students or some other target or choose problems that are less culturally embedded. So think about ones that maybe are situated at school that they can all relate to. So again, that looks at that idea of input. How are we creating a context for learning? So here's an ex example of decoding the context. If you remember in class, um, a couple of weeks ago, we did a polygon problem, and I started with a notice and wonder. And for those of you who are attending the webinar here, a notice and wonder is just where you would put something up and ask students, what do they notice in the picture? What do you wonder? And then you could go ahead and chart that. So um, it's a high context task, right? You would need to know what these shapes are, be able to come in with some knowledge. So as you're looking at this, you can start unpacking some of the material by just jotting down what the students notice about it and what they wonder. Here's some other examples from lessons that students have done. So you could put a picture up with a notice and wonder, and then there's some charting that um, students in the classroom came up with. Both have three sides, points, equals, equal lengths of each triangle. Um, in the large triangle, how many triangles fit into the large triangle? Is the triangle double the length of the smaller triangle? So these are all things that they notice and wonder that you can um, use as a strategy in your classrooms. Again, here's another one where they're looking at weights and measurements. So what do we know or what is this telling us and what do we wonder about? It's a great way to start a lesson. This would be something you could do right in the launch to help unpack the context um, and decode. So moving right along, then we look at how we can enrich the context tools. What tools can you provide students as they attack the problems? So you want to provide a variety so that students have different ways to look at um, the context. Remember how you learn to solve a problem in different ways. You need that skill now to, to think about how you can help the students in your classroom. So again, this is looking at that idea of input. So here's some examples of enriching the context using tools. So again, going back to the polygon example that we did in class, and it's okay if you haven't done this problem before, um, just giving you some pictures and ideas about how you might solve this task. So you may need to have 
have materials available for your students. Actually, you will need materials available for your students. It just depends on the task, what materials you will gather. So for the polygon example, we use grid paper, um, cutouts, tracing paper, whiteboard. So this was all were all tools that were used to help you explain your thinking with the task. Here's another one where you're using um, two tools for the same task. So there are candy bars, um, there could be manipulatives, they're using money here. So a variety, excuse me, a variety of tools can be used to help make knowledge of the situation. Um, right here, we have a list of the toolbox. You want to have manipulatives, your whiteboards, your brain, paper, and pencil. Here we see students using um pattern blocks to make sense of the mathematics. And here we have um, number charts. So there's numerous ways that you can provide materials for students to help them understand. Again, here's another one where we see students actively engaging in math by doing measurement, using grids, um, and other hands-on materials. Here we have students using cubes to solve tasks. So a variety of real-world examples. So when we look at the context, it's really important. That's the first part of input. Now we're going to look at language demands, which is that second part of the input. So when we look at that, we're going to analyze the English language demands. And so this is looking at the linguistic demands of a task. We want to study the use of English structures that might be problematic. We're going to see some examples on the next couple slides. So choose one or two demands that you would want to focus on. So there's a number of, of different linguistic demands, um, words that have several different meanings that can be confusing for students, looking at word order, mathematical symbols, do they understand what the symbol means, um, looking at changes in verbs to adjust for different tenses. Is it present tense? Is it past tense? Those kinds of things. So there's a number of different, um, here's just a checklist for you. You can look at some of them, think about one or two of them, but these are all things as a teacher you want to think about ahead of time. What's going to be hard for my students in this task? You want to think about how you can unpack that with them. And then, of course, in input, looking at um, language, we want to look at the development of vocabulary. So pre-teach only the terms the students need to tackle for the task. So um, you want to choose no more than three math terms and develop them well. So if there's things that are going to be tricky that you think your students won't understand, you want to highlight that vocabulary so that they know what it is moving forward. They should relate to the central math idea of the lesson don't pre-teach them, develop them throughout the lesson as needed. So this is where you can bring in tangible objects, you can use visuals, but you're having conversations about it. So they're developing that knowledge of what a vocab term is through what they're doing in the lesson. So for effective vocabulary instruction, we have to think about, we need to study the words for word parts or cognates. Think about the multi-meaning words that we have in English. There's so many, so we need to teach them well. Um, we need to think about rich input. Keep it real for students. Use your own student-friendly language to um, define them. Pull the students' ideas in language. So maybe you put a word on the board. Has anybody ever heard of it? Can we create a context for it? Can we draw pictures um, that can help illuminate that term? Using other words that, that could help them connect with that. Um, use them in a few different sentences so they can see how words can be used. Write them on strips of paper. So anytime you can create visual displays or word walls, that's helpful for vocabulary instruction. Again, this is all part of input. So let me show you some examples of vocabulary instruction. And this is in lessons. Going back to our polygon lesson from before, and see how the word polygon is, um, or a parallelogram rather, is defined. Um, there's other terms that could be used as well. There's visual aids that help explain. Uh, what about the word unique? The only one of its kind, having definitions for that is helpful. What does that mean if we're coming up with unique configurations of parallelograms? 
how do we do that? What does unique mean? What does a parallelogram mean? Those would be important for students to do if they were coming up with different parallelograms in a lesson. Here's another lesson as well that um, pre-service teachers were, were doing in the classroom. So you could use um, word boards, having the words up somewhere, sentence frames, but also looking at defining terms like ratio. So you should could have that up somewhere. You could also have it on slides ahead of time so that the students can reference it in the lesson. Also, when you're looking at a problem in the context, you could have different words highlighted that you're gonna talk about ahead of time. Remember how I said only focus on no more than three words. You talk about what does it mean to be unique, consistent, and compare, what does that mean? So having conversations about that using um, your slideshow to help you. Also, net, right? Nets are um, is a word that has multiple meanings. We had talked about this before. We have butterfly nets. We have um, nets that we use for sports. There are safety nets, but a net could also be a layout for a structure. If you cut this apart, I could fold it up and make a box out of it. So that's also looked at as a net. So you can see how we have multiple uh, meanings for words. So you want to talk about the different meanings and then um, talk about how it's related to the context of what you're asking students to do in the specific math task. Okay, so we talked about the two different inputs for language development in particular to mathematics. Now we're going to talk about the output. So using the language in mathematics. First output we're going to look at is norms and academic conversation skills. And the next one is structured opportunities for language production. So when we look at formative assessments, um, we look at this to help us enhance our outputs, right? So these are things such as teacher listening to students, giving think time, um, using turn and talk, think pair share. Um, you might require multiple responses to one question or multiple ways to solve it. Using certain hand signals, give me a thumbs up if you agree, thumbs down if you disagree, and make sure you can support your thinking. Using whiteboards, what do you think about this answer or show me your answer or um, exit tickets or partner quizzes. Those are all different outputs. So when we think about building norms and skills for academic conversation, we want to set our norms for how you and your students use mathematical language. So for example, this is what you would state in class and reinforce throughout the whole year. We are kind and purposeful in helping each other with English and the language of math. We share ideas to get better ideas. We value precision in language. So those are all things you can post in the, in the classroom so that we know this is the focus of our mathematics learning. We want to post them, teach them, reinforce them. And then we have to think about skills for conversations in our math classes. We need to post and teach your talk moves, right? So we've talked about talk moves before. Select one or two focus talk moves for any lesson. Sometimes it's overwhelming to say, oh, just pick any talk move. So having those selected ahead of time give the students a prompt for what they're going to talk about in their math conversations. I'll show you some of examples of these in subsequent slides. And you're going to monitor as students use a, a use of talk moves. So you're going to vary them throughout your instruction, use lots of different ones. Select and share good examples of language use ideas. Position your students as powerful. So as you're hearing these conversations in the class, when you call them back together to share out, call on specific students that you could see were really giving good examples of using these talk moves and have them share out what they said in their partner groups. So here's some examples of building those norms and skills for using English in the math classroom. Again, um, AB partners talking about, this goes back to our polygon example, which we did in class, AB partners, productive partners, you want to talk about how it's important you look at your partner, you lean together, you lower your voice. If you're having a conversation, it's that six inch voice. You wouldn't be screaming across the room and listen attentively. Here's a poster too that is um, gives examples of those different talk moves. So um, they get you started on something. For example, I would like to add on to what I heard 
Jose saying, or here's what I heard you say. Um, you might agree or disagree with that person. Um, so these are all ways that can help you to, to reflect on the math and have conversations with others. So you can pick one or two per lesson to help you um, get the students talking. Um, here's some other ones you for agreeing and disagreeing. I agree with that because this is true because I disagree because. So giving those kind of sentence starters, you can repeat or ask to repeat. You can give your reasoning or you can ask for someone else's reasoning. Why do you think that? So being naturally curious. These are things that we have to have um, posted in our room so students will get to used to using this different language. Here's some more um, examples of using talk moves. I use the blocks by blank because of blank. I agree with a particular individual because, or I disagree because. Um, so these are all different charts and ways that you can use those talk moves. Which leads us to output number four, which is providing varied structured opportunities for using academic English and math. So we want to structure lots of partner activities. Um, students have a tendency to talk more when it's just in a partnership. It feels um, less stressful than having to talk out in a whole classroom of learners. So the more comfortable they are in talking in partnerships in small groups, we can build that confidence so that they'll feel um, even more comfortable to be vulnerable in speaking out in whole group settings. We want to use sentence frames to incorporate your the ELD goals talk, remember, we're using talk moves and, um, and, and we're talking about these mathematical ideas that are really important. Um, we want to use sentence frames. We want to have them posted and modeled around the room and we can monitor and adjust them. Sometimes we want them to just look at differing opinions. Maybe we want them to revoice what somebody else said so that they're practicing listening to each other. Um, over time, all students need to work with all other students. We want to vary partner structures, sometimes language alike groups, sometimes language different groups, sometimes random groups, sometimes groups are based on certain interests. So here's some examples of structured opportunities for using English in the classroom. So again, this goes back to the polygon examples. Here's some um, sentence frames that can help you get students started to have these conversations in math. So you're saying that, fill in the blank. I discovered that one thing so-and-so did that I did differently or that I need to understand better is or one thing that I did and I saw somebody else do was this. So you're helping them to have those, those conversations. Here's another one. In your groups, partner A, start by counting the number of shapes given to fit in the frame. This goes back to our polygon lesson. And partner B, start manipulating the shapes to fit into the frame. Partner C, what were some shapes folded or overlapped? Then you come together for a solution and you're using the talk move. So this is specific directions and giving a task for each partner in the group. So that way there's more active involvement and they're each contributing to um, the rich math task. Again, examples of sentence frames that could be given to students that can be posted around the room for their reference. Um, you want students to compare different solutions. So they're showing their work by coming up to the board or um, getting together in small groups and talking. Here, right here, we have an example of, of trio talk. And again, these are all from lessons that were done by pre-service teachers in um, the mathematics methods classrooms. And then here's um, also talking about output as writing. In addition to speaking, we focused a lot about conversations that you have in math, but this would be something you would see in the closure of a lesson, a ticket out the door where you'd have the students write what they're thinking um, or one, one way they solve the problem, you would collect those. And that's something that you can analyze to see how they're using words or pictures to explain their thinking about the mathematics. Here's another idea um, for a lesson is writing a letter to a friend. Imagine you're writing to a friend to explain to them the cubes, nets, and uh, cutouts for making different nets. Make sure to number 
the cuts in your picture. So here you would um, explain your thinking and uh, write a letter explaining it to a friend. So um, it would depend on the mathematics tax here. You would situate it for that. But it's another tool to show you how you can collect some data from students and look at how they're using writing, not just um, oral language in math. So just as a recap um, of what we focused on today, it's looking at mathematics learning and language development. And there were four major strategies for building academic language and mathematics. We had two that were focused on input and two that were focused on output. So um, when we looked at language input, we're looking at understanding language through comprehensible input. And the way we looked at that one was decoding and enriching the context. So we have to think about our culture and tools to help with that. And then we want to analyze and address linguistic demands and vocabulary development. That all needs to be done up front to help the students know what they need to do to engage in the rich math task. And then we want to think about output. So how do we produce that language? Well, we need them to build norms and skills for conversations throughout the mathematics classroom. How are we going to situate that so they're talking to each other, that you're listening to students' um, mathematical ideas? And then we want to provide varied, structured opportunities for using academic English and mathematics. And there were some examples, um, remember exit tickets or how they're explaining their thinking, both in written and then also through conversation. So hopefully you're storing that in your mind somewhere. We are going to um, be mindful of this as we're thinking about building mathematics lessons. Where would you structure opportunities in a math lesson for input? maybe right at the beginning, maybe at that launch or as they're first starting out in the body of the lesson output, we would see that also you might have some of that at the beginning where you're setting up norms and then throughout the lesson with sentence frames and talk moves. Um, and then also output we'd like to see at the end through exit tickets or any other journaling or forms that you're having students fill out to explain their thinking that you would collect. So um thanks for listening today i'm gonna stop sharing my screen um and i hope you have a wonderful rest of the day bye for now